So I'm going to use a word that you may never have heard in church before, although it's not a dirty word. It's just a slang term, and the term is jonesing. Now, how many of you know what that means? Ah, that tells me a bit about you. So I, I looked up where it came from because I think this is an important concept, even though it's kind of an atypical word. And there was a Jones Alley that was in Manhattan. And in the 70s, that was kind of where drug addicts would go and hang out. So there was a slang term that when you were jonesing, you were heading down to Jones Alley to get another fix of drugs. And and this addictive cycle that so many people get into is where I'm jonesing, I'm looking for a fix, something to fill my my, my deep emptiness, really, but something to give me a hit, a high. And then they use drugs, alcohol, pornography, all kinds of things. And then there's the hangover, or they get over it, or <laughs> try to outlive the uh, things you did while you were high. And then there's this slow drift back to jonesing again. And I, I believe that's a very, very powerful spiritual reality that unless you and I come to a place where we are being filled with a relationship with Jesus Christ and where our peace and our hope and our purpose and our meaning in life, our identity comes from Christ, we're going to be jonesing for something. You can, you can be jonesing for food. I know sometimes I'm thinking, it's mid-afternoon and I'm thinking, what could I eat for dessert? And I'm not hungry at all. It's just something to fill and make you feel excited or interested. And we can fill it with work, and we can fill it with excitement. We can fill it with cars or toys or, or fishing or dresses or shoes. or There's a thousand things we use. And perhaps one of the most serious parts of this is that at the bottom level, we have a tendency to use people to try to fill an emptiness, to try to fill a sense of what I need to make my life meaningful and worthwhile. And using people is the opposite of loving people. And so when we talk about how does a relationship with Jesus change me so that it changes my marriage and it changes my, my relationship with my kids and my neighbors and my friends and my enemies even, we're really going back to that core heart level that no matter what happens, you can't find anything that will fit that God-sized hole. And you can spend your whole life jonesing for things that will never ultimately satisfy. They'll give you a short, high hit for a minute. Buy something new, have a new truck, a new something, but it won't last. And ultimately, the hole comes back. And this reminds me of a, of a powerful story. Uh, one of my trips to Israel, we took a visit to the Garden of Gethsemane. And last week we talked about the Last Supper and Jesus meeting with his disciples just before he was betrayed and crucified. And, and, and it was this incredibly uh, touching and powerful time where he knelt down and washed their feet and loved them. And the, right after that, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane was just an olive grove that was where the people from the Galilee area would stay during Passover. It was their traditional area. And they, Jesus and his disciples evidently had a specific place. And when we were there in the Garden of Gethsemane, it's really amazing because they've preserved some of the trees and some of them are, are huge. And olive trees don't get higher as they get older, they get wider. And some of those trees would have been little shoots 2,000 years ago. And so it was a, it's, a, it's a sacred place. It's a place where you really are brought, brought to bear with Jesus facing his own crucifixion. And, and one of the guides who was a, a Jewish woman who is not a follower of Jesus, she said, you know, in my opinion, this place is as important as the cross. And I'd never really thought about that. She said, but isn't it here where Jesus made up his mind? Isn't it here where he said, not my will, but yours be done to God the Father? And, and I was thinking about that and, and the story of Jesus being so overwhelmed in his humanness, not only about facing the, the cruel torture he was going to go through, but, but facing taking the sin of the world on himself and paying that debt. And, 
And he was so distraught that he was bleeding uh, in, the, in the sweat of his brow. The capillaries had ruptured as they can under great stress. And, and that was just one little picture of the, the stress he was under. <laughs> and his closest three friends were sleeping instead of praying with him. And yet he's, he's wrestling. And, and the verse here is in Luke chapter 22. And he says that he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. And he knelt down and he prayed Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. We have a great tendency to want to add God to our life so that we can get our will done more effectively. And that's not the way it works. This is, this is the bottom line that we have to come to again and again. Not my will, not my desires, but yours. And so as Jesus came to that place in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was moving from there to crucifixion. And yet the amazing story that comes out of that, the story of what Jesus came to do, he didn't just come to die, he came to bring life. And he came to bring us eternal life. I find this is a really common misconception that, that eternal life starts when you die and then we start talking about living with God forever. Eternal life starts the moment you actually submit and return your, turn your life over to Christ and then you have the life of Christ in you. You have an eternal kind of life that we are now living in connection with God. So he came to give us life at every level and the, the irony is that the road to life is through death that I will only learn to let God love me as I really die to my will and say, your will, not mine. And I will only really learn to love other people as I die to my incredibly strong tendency to use people to make myself feel better. That I will use instead of love unless I die to myself. And I want to read a couple verses from John chapter 10. If you have your Bibles open, uh, We'll read together if you want to flip open the YouVersion app or whatever. And this is a very uh, beautiful passage where Jesus talks about the, the reflection of Psalm 23 about the Lord being our shepherd. And he says, I am the good shepherd. So let me read for you in uh, John 10 verse 9. He said, I am the gate and whoever enters through me will be saved and they will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal to kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and they might have it to the full. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That the whole purpose of Jesus coming was not to, here's the thief, he's jonesing for whatever he can get. Steal, kill, destroy, trying to get his will. And Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. And, and one of the translations calls it the abundant life. And, and I think what, a, what an interesting contrast. Are you living an addictive life or an abundant life? And, and when I think abundant life, I think sometimes we think, oh, that means I get all the stuff I want. In other words, I'm going to use Jesus to get a new high. In fact, I think it's why often when people first come to Christ, they have this e- euphoric kind of emotional response. And then when it gets down to the, the actual daily learning to be a disciple and following Jesus, it's like, well, this isn't that fun. And they didn't even realize they were trying to use Jesus. They were jonesing for Jesus instead of really coming to a place of surrender and of learning what the kind of life Jesus came to give. And so in this picture, he says, I come that you might have life. And he died so he could connect us to God. And the the word we use for that is the word reconciliation. And simply reconciliation means two people that were enemies, that were at odds, that were separated. They have now come together. There is a, they've been reconciled. And what that really works like for us is that now I am made, from the time I was in the Garden of Eden, I was made to have a relationship with God. And when I have not got that relationship with God, there is a God-sized hole in me. And reconciliation says Jesus came and he died to pay the debt for our sins so that we could be reconciled to God. And especially we who are Gentiles, we were like way out there. We weren't part of the covenants of the 
of the nation of Israel. We weren't, weren't part of understanding all of the Old Testament sacrifices. We weren't, we weren't part of any of that. We were way outside. And we were headed towards destruction and hell. And it says Jesus came so we could be connected to God. And, and one of the most beautiful words out of that is that we've been adopted. That we who had no right to have any connection to God, we, we can be adopted into his family through the, through the work of Jesus on the cross for us. And you see what's, what's interesting is that addiction is often a legitimate need met in an illegitimate way. Let, let me say that again. An addiction is often an Ill, a legitimate need met in an illegitimate way, a wrong way. And sometimes people actually quit one addiction and then just switch to another one because they haven't dealt with the hole in them. They've just dealt with, I'm quitting this thing. In fact, uh, recovery programs have an interesting word. They call it being a dry drunk. And that means somebody who has quit drinking alcohol, but they've not dealt with any of the wrong beliefs and the wrong behaviors and all of the things. They just are using people in different ways or they're using other things. And Jesus came to connect us to God the Father because it's from God that we will actually get what we really need, the legitimate need is we need to be deeply loved and connected and filled with his spirit and in connection with the creator of the universe. That's what we're jonesing for. And everything else is a substitute. And uh, so he came to connect us to God and then we talk about the fact that on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sin. But it's really a lot bigger than that. He, he came to give us an absolute full forgiveness. And this doesn't always make sense to people that hear it the first time, but, but Jesus came and he took all of your sin and all of mine and he paid the penalty completely. We have been given now the goodness of Jesus. That means my sins in the past are forgiven. My sins of today are forgiven. My sins of the next 20 years are forgiven because now I am not on my behavior trying to get better and not do more good things and fewer bad things. Now I am on the process where I am learning to live in the goodness that Jesus has given to me. And what that means is that I had a million dollar debt. I was an enemy of God. I was jonesing for everything and making everything else my own God. And Jesus has delivered me from the penalty of sin. But that's only half the gospel. That's only the the beginning side of it, and that's a wonderful story, but it's even better. Romans 5.10 is a verse I was really reflecting on as I was looking this week, and it says, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, that's what we've just talked about, then it says, How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Isn't that powerful? How much more? Yes, that took care of my debt. That took care of the, the deadness and the, the estrangement from God. But he says, now the life of Christ actually comes to live within me. And he fills me with his love and he begins to love through me and live through me. And so he says, how much more? When we were enemies, he reconciled us. How much more now that we are adopted and his children, will he save us? Will he continue to work in us? And that's that, that's that idea of eternal life continues all the time from the time I accept Christ all the way till I get to heaven and then it continues. That he is changing me and filling me. And one of the wonderful side benefits of that is that God gives us contentment. That instead of having to have everything else fill us up and and for some people it's a neat and clean house and for some people it's a high bank account and, and we look for all these external things to make it okay in here. And you know what? It will never work. Not ultimately. And what's amazing is when Christ comes in, he gives us, if we receive it from him, the gift of contentment. And you can quit jonesing. You can say, okay, I am full because of who I am in Christ. Now I have a privilege of giving it to others. And that is such a a critical idea that that's where the power to love comes from. That's where the motivation, this is the the 30,000 view that says this is the big deal about how we can actually have that kind of fruit in our life. That we get a new perspective on 
what life is about and who we are. We have a new perspective on other people. We have a new perspective on, on what it actually means to love instead of use people. And now in a practical shift, how does that actually work in our marriages? How does being filled with Jesus and, and being forgiven of my sin and, and being given love beyond belief, how does that relate to my marriage? And, and I want to say just a word to the singles before we move on to the marriage, as we did last week. And uh, I, I was a told by several single people, thank you for mentioning us, and that was a really important part. And, and I know that there's all different kinds of singleness, including spiritually single, which I don't think I mentioned last week. And I guess what I wanna say to you is all of these topics are how we are to live in connection with one another. And if you are not married, you need deep and, and spiritual relationships. And I'll tell you, if you're not married and looking to get married, there is no person that will fill that hole in you because the hole in you has to be filled by Jesus first. And in fact, if you're interested in, a, in looking for a marriage partner, there's a great book called Sacred Search, which talks about how to find uh, the person that God has for you, and it's a very uh, biblically-based way to do that. But I want you to know that singleness is a vitally important part of our, that your relationship is, to Christ is just as important and then we want to encourage you in how to find those relationships where you can have vulnerable, open, devoted, honest relationships that help you grow and, find, and give you that support that you need. But last week we talked about the ABCs, the alphabet of love. And we're talking about specifically as applied to marriages, but it works with any relationship. And we talked about accepting one another just as I am. I deeply want to be loved and accepted with my personality, with my weaknesses, with my failures. I, I want people to accept me. And it's so much easier to want that for myself than it is to want that for somebody else. But that's what marriage is to be about, to say, I love you just like you are. And then the second one is to bear with each other, to realize that love is not this romantic where we always think the same way and always speak the same way. It means <laughs> that opposites attract and then opposites attack. And so we're gonna learn to, to work together and learn to compromise and learn to learn from each other. And then the third one is challenge one another. And I put a whole list of these in your outline. And, and I wanted you partly just to be overwhelmed with these bullet points of what is our life supposed to be like, this, this high standard of love that God calls us to. And not pull it down and just try to be nice, but to say, this is what God calls me to. By the power of Christ in me, I'm gonna try to live that out. And the, the C is to challenge one another. And it comes out of Hebrews 10 where he says, consider how to provoke each other to love and good works. And, and part of that is to, to think about what my life can do to help you grow and help encourage you and help move you ahead. And so the ABCs were last week and now we're gonna go DEF. We're gonna do the next three. And again, they're from this list of things that we can do to live out the love of Christ. And the D comes from Romans chapter 12, verse 10. And it says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. All the way through, it talks about this idea of elevating others and caring for others and being truly empathetic for what's going on in their life. And we do that, we accept one another because God accepted us. We bear with one another because <laughs> God is so patient with us. We challenge each other because God keeps challenging us. See, all of these are, are based on the vertical, that I'm getting this from God and therefore I can give this to you. And because God is a loyal God who continues to pursue us and loves us no matter how badly we mess up. So it says we are to be devoted to one another. And that devoted to one another means more than just don't quit on each other. It means don't quit loving each other. Um, every marriage has rough spots. Uh, if you've only been married three months, maybe you haven't got there, but every marriage has difficult places. Places where you have to go back and say, why are we here and why am I married? And, and that devotion comes out of, again, of God's loyal love for me and the fact that, honestly, most great marriages have worked through some really hard things to get to the places where they are. And so that idea of being devoted means that not only do I just hang in there and not divorce you, it means that I continue to pursue 
how to love you and how to learn to love you, and, and I continue to do that just as you are no matter what happens. And wouldn't it be wonderful, wouldn't it be amazing if every couple at Family Church was accepting each other, was bearing lovingly with each other, was challenging each other, and was deeply devoted? Because it's amazing that the divorce rate in the church and the divorce rate out of the church are about the same. And I'm disturbed as a pastor that when a couple's having struggles, too often the advice they're getting from their friends are just dump the creep, start over, there's lots of fish in the sea, get out of here. And I'm not saying that there's never a point where divorce becomes the the right choice, but I'm saying that we quit way too easily and too early. And so let me challenge you as you're thinking about what does this mean? It means to hang in there and to love. And there's a wonderful love story by from a guy named Robertson McQuilkin, and he was the president of Columbia International University, and uh, this was been his whole life. In fact, his father had started the college, and he was married to Muriel, and they had had six children together, and he had been uh, a president of this college, and she'd been a teacher there, and he'd been a president for 22 years. And a few years before that, his wife had come down with early onset Alzheimer's, and he tried valiantly to keep his job as president and still take care of her. But the more the disease progressed, the more she became anxious and she couldn't be at rest anywhere except when she was with Robertson. And so one day he he came home and she had left the home and she had been, she was barefoot and her bloody feet were marking the the, the floor because she had walked all around town trying to find him. And he said, "I, I can't do that anymore. And so It's on YouTube, there's an amazing resignation speech in which he says this. He says, when the time came, the decision was firm. It took no great calculation, it was a matter of integrity. Hadn't I promised 42 years before, in sickness and in health, till death do us part? And then he says, and I think this is the beautiful part, there was no grim duty to which I stoically was resigned. It was only fair. She had, after all, cared for me for almost four decades with marvelous devotion, and now it was my turn. And such a partner she was. If I took care of her for 40 years, I would never be out of her debt. What an amazing picture of devotedness, of faithfulness, of hanging in there, of knowing what real love means in spite of the difficulties. And then the, the E is that Jesus wants us to understand even though we're tempted to quit, to to not quit on either our our relationships or on loving. But then the next verse is in 1 Thessalonians and it says, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. And a challenge that our conversations in our life would be filled with words of encouragement and, and acts of encouragement. And I think it's so easy in the in the intimate relationships of our life to be critical of each other, to be short with each other, to use tones of voice that, that are demeaning or hurtful. And, and I want to just think this through the, with you. about What does it mean to encourage one another? And I think, <laughs> we were laughing about these masks and all the controversy around the masks, and I, I said, you know, when I wear the mask that says family church on it, I have to be really careful what words come out of my mouth. But you know, we, we wear... Uh, the face of Jesus in us, and we should always be careful about what comes out of our mouth, even with the people we live with, even with our spouse. And so I want you to say, what, what does it mean to be encouraging? L- let me give you just three quick, simple, simple words. It means appreciation. Thank you is an important word. In fact, we were over at Will and Crystal Irwin's house, and, and they were saying how they had made a new effort to teach their children to say please and thank you. And you know what they realized? <laughs> Uh, they needed to practice on it themselves because their kids would catch them not saying it as well. It, it's easy to get out of the habit with our family just to say thank you. Thank you for what you did. And, and if we are all lovingly washing each other's feet, then there should be lots of thank you. And sometimes washing each other's feet actually means like washing the dishes or washing the floor or, or just taking care of things, taking the trash out. And it makes so much difference when somebody says thank you. Not like I have to, but Thank you, I appreciate you doing that. And it means words of affirmation. You're really good about that, or I love that about you, or boy, are you gifted. And I tell you, every now and then, somebody will just say a sincere, meaningful compliment, 
and it just buoys you up. It makes you feel like, I, I can keep going through all kinds of criticism when I get a few of those. And it means that we, we need to have words that are, are kind in right tones, but it also means that our actions have to be that, to serve, to care for. Those are encouraging words. And he said, our, our lives should be encouraging to each other. And, and I think the opposite of encouraging or the temptation that comes with it is to criticize and really a deeper to control. <laughs> and if we're honest, we have a terrible tendency to want to use our spouse to make our lives better. Now, we wouldn't say it like that, and we wouldn't say we were an addict, but we have a great tendency to want them to become more what we want them to be or what would be making us happier, what would make us uh, uh, at least more happy for the day. And so I want to I wanna bring an important question, series of questions that we've been talking about as a staff, and I've shared this with several people. But when you're talking about a marriage relationship and challenging each other and, and giving encouraging words, I think often there's that reaction in us, well, if I don't straighten them out, then they'll just keep doing it wrong. Or if I don't fix them, or if I don't challenge them, and, and there's a loving way to challenge. But you have to ask yourself the question, what's my part What's God's part and what's their part? And you see, we want to do God's part and be the Holy Spirit and convict them and and try to straighten them out and we are very bad at it. And we often don't want to do our part, which is to make sure that I am A, B, C, D, E, I am treating them with the love of Christ. And sometimes we want to do that other person's part. We want to get in and rearrange their life. And, And I believe in most cases, It's up to us to pray and let God change people and we are to be there to support and encourage and on occasion challenge. So think about that. In your conversations with your spouse, how often do you ask them to change versus how often you appreciate what they've already been doing or you appreciate who they are and how they are and that's one of the key encouragements. And then the the last one is perhaps something we need to talk about about every month and that is In Ephesians 4, he says, Be kind and compassionate to one another. Again, the same flavor. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. So important. Because the biggest problem in marriage is not finances, it's not children, it's not communication styles, it's not conflict styles. The biggest problem in every marriage is sin. The problem is two sinners married each other. And that in our selfishness and in our tendency to use and in our our desire for control, we hurt each other. And there's a lot, a lot of pain in, in these intimate and important relationships. And God wants us to learn how to encourage instead of control. He wants us to learn how to how to treat each other kindly, but we are fallible and we are human. And so we will eventually go back to failing, and then we need that forgiveness. And the marriage has to be of two good forgivers, not two perfect people. And this forgiveness is such a critically important story because that is what causes us to be able to have a lifelong, loving marriage. It's like if you lived in a mansion and you never took out the trash, you would soon live in a dump. And there has to be a way of fixing those hurts and resolving the conflicts and and coming back to being in love with each other and caring for each other and letting things go. And we've talked about this because often I don't feel like forgiving, especially if I feel hurt badly and deeply. And and so there's lots of excuses. They don't deserve it. They might do it again. Um, You know, I don't think they're sorry enough. They didn't really apologize well enough. And and I want to tell you that forgiving is what God has done for us And out of his great forgiveness for us, it's a gift that you give. And we've talked about this before, but I want to reinforce it. Forgiveness is three parts. It's a choice that says, I choose to forgive you because I've been forgiven a million dollar debt. I choose to forgive you again and again and again. And it's an act of the will. It's not not an emotion. It's not a response of, "I, I think that you're sorry enough and now you've earned it. It's a choice. So I forgive you is a choice. The second part, which is usually longer, is I am forgiving you. I'm working on it. I am 
continually re when those hurts come up in my mind when the when I argue with you in my own head and things I'd like to say to you I'm actually making when I say I choose to forgive you I'm making three promises and this is the am forgiving part which is I won't dwell on it when those thoughts come back into my mind when I review the the circumstances I'm not going to let that stay in my head I'm, I'm going to get rid of it because that's toxic and it's it's not only damaging to our relationship it's eating me up So I'm going to get rid of it. I'm not going to dwell on it. Secondly, I'm not going to gossip about it. I'm not going to go tell other people what you said or what you did and try to get them on my side. I won't gossip because that's what it is. And and thirdly is I won't attack you with it. And boy, there's a lot of people who let things go and let things go and then they build up and blow up. and, And when they blow up, they haul out everything that's happened in the last three years. And when you say I forgive you, it means I will never throw that in your face again. And that helps you work through this process of I am forgiving you by the power of Jesus in me and by the the forgiveness I've received. And then finally you come to the third step, which is I have forgiven. What does that mean? That you doesn't change history, it doesn't change the offense, but it means that I'm no longer angry about it. It means that it doesn't keep coming up in my mind. In fact, I I would say the first is a choice, the second's a process, and the third is freedom. That I can finally say I have forgiven. There's not heat in it anymore. It's not, it's not driving me. It's not dividing us from each other. It's not preoccupying my thinking. And boy, I tell you, this is so, so important because so many couples that get into a bad place, they can take a five-minute quarrel and turn it into a five-month fight. And there's more and more and more damage done all the way. And healthy couples have quarrels. <laughs> and if you can quit in the middle of it and separate and pray and respond to God and then come together and resolve it. You can have a five-minute quarrel that's done in five minutes instead of ruining and destroying so much of your life. You know, there's, there's such a great tendency that we have to put high expectations on other people. And there, there's a funny story I heard about a, a man who was coming to church with his wife and she was a believer and she was praying for him and in her prayer meeting she would ask, pray for my husband and, and she was very intent and he came and he listened and he was, you know, reasonably responsive and, and one day the pastor got him alone by himself and he just said, Harold, why won't you ever give your life to Christ? It seems like you come and you listen and you seem to be responsive and, and Harold gets this kind of conspiratorial twinkle in his eye and he said, Pastor, I have given my life to Christ, but don't tell my wife. And he thought, well, if you've given your life to Christ, why wouldn't you tell your wife? She's been wanting this for years. He said, oh, I know, but her expectations of me are so high already, I can't live up to them. And if she knew where I were a Christian, it would just be 10 times as much. And I think that's a funny story, but it's a sad, it's a sad case. And the fact that we don't always understand how it is that I let Christ work in me so that I can live Christ out in my marriage. And I think we are deeply, deeply tempted to control, to bitterness, to using each other instead of loving each other. And and when we come with all of our broken pieces and we come with all of that, that ugly stuff, we say that this is why we need Jesus. This is why we go back to the cross. This is why I come. And, And as we celebrate communion this weekend, you go back and you think, Oh, God, my life is such a mess without you. Thank you again for my forgiveness. Thank you again for loving me. Thank you that I am accepted, that you put up with me, that that you challenge me, that you're devoted to me, that you encourage me, that you forgive me. And out of that alphabet of love, as we talked about last week, is I am again filled up and poured into because of what's real and eternal and true then I can go out and begin to learn to live in those kinds of steps of love. And for those of you who've gone through difficult times in your marriage, those of you who are at a rough spot in your marriage, let me challenge and encourage you to come and again kneel before Jesus and get that part straight. Do your part and then let God do his part and pray that your partner will do their part. But you've got a full-time job taking care of your own part. And as we come and as we celebrate who Jesus is and what he's done, I really hope that it helps you beginning today
to respond differently to your marriage partner and for those of you who are single to respond to your friends and your family. I'm going to dismiss to the campuses and we're going to be celebrating communion different times, different ways, depending on where you are. But let this be a time where you let Jesus deepen your relationship with him.